My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far away from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashar surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he does not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all nations. To him indeed, all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all those who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. Proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. I picked Psalm 22 for the Blue Christmas sermon. <clears throat> Because um, the Psalms, this Psalm and the Psalms give us permission to be angry and yell at and with God. The Psalms are these like spaces of raw human emotion where people can scream to God for help or they can scream at God for the help that they did not receive that they needed. And it's a great way to start <clears throat> the Blue Christmas Sermon because it's really important to know that we have a God that we can bring it to. I remember being young, asking my mother, who is a clergywoman herself, about the Psalms, and, but I was very uncomfortable with a lot of them, and she said, but sweetheart... To know that God is big enough to handle anything that we can throw at God is so, so important. So important for us to know. So I was writing this sermon, and I wrote it in a sense of dark humor. So if you find yourself laughing at times, that's fine. Or crying, that's fine. You can do what you want. Um, it's mostly a story about my life, part of my life. So just last week, um, 
Some friends of mine here at church lost a parent very suddenly. And then um, a couple days later on Monday, my friend found out that she's going to have to have a hysterectomy, which wouldn't be that big deal except that her and her husband were just about to start trying. And I am officially out of granola bars that I hand to the homeless people that beg at the off-ramp between my work and my home. I live at 55 in Loughborough. And every day, I'm usually there driving by it at least twice a day. There is another person who smells and who is hungry and who is dirty. And I am out of granola bars to hand them. So I've just been handing them whatever cash I have. And I'm kind of in the mood now where it's like, here's $5. Spend it on rum. I don't care. Do what you want. And honestly, if I have to hear Andy Williams' rendition of it's, a most, the most, it's the most wonderful time of the year again, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind. I hate that song. And I, he's an excellent singer, but I don't like him singing it either. I'm a person... <clears throat> who needs a blue Christmas service in my life. I'm a person who is, uh, like, affected. I experience physical affect over the emotional state of others and myself, and this is how I end up with no voice during the blue Christmas service, because I had, was dealing with all these feelings, and then they became enfleshed. So again, please excuse how I sound right now. So I named this sermon, Crying on My Kitchen Floor, which was a moment that I had around this time last year, in 2016, in December. But before I get to that particular moment and what got me to that space, there's like a history. So in January of 2015, about two years ago, three years ago now, yeah. My brother Tom died suddenly. He was curled up on his couch, snuggling his wife and his son. And his wife woke up around midnight and realized that his body was cold. Um, and they rushed the son downstairs. He had undiagnosed diabetes. And five months later, I found my dad's body at his office. He had died with something probably cholesterol-related, maybe a stroke, maybe a heart attack. He was on a lot of meds, and so they weren't really surprised. And we don't know how long it took for him to die, but he, um, he died alone. And four months later, we celebrated my daughter's first birthday. And then the next week, my stepfather, a man who was pretty much equally as formative in my life as my, as my bio dad, as we called him, um, he went in for lung cancer surgery, and the surgery was successful. Um, he was a firefighter, and so it was a large cell melanoma that they were able to operate on. Um, and, but even though um, he basically didn't recover because even though he had quit, he was a smoker for years, and he had emphysema, and so his lungs couldn't bounce back. And so he died two days before Christmas. And that was my 2015 and I preached all of their, three of their funerals, and very few people in this church of thousands knew that any of that was happening in my life. So, like, I just wanted to be said that I am a person and a clergywoman um, that believes no one in my presence will ever get to tell the morning that there is a reason for everything or that these things are part of God's plan, or that heaven needed another angel. Those are terrible, terrible things to say. And they're not real. And they don't handle the depth of loss. At the very least, if this is God's plan, that it is terrible planning. And it gives a really trite response to relationships that are far from trite. I get stabby when I hear people use these kind of words. When I get stabby when I hear people talk 
like that to those who are suffering. And I, not so much if it's a lay person, but if I hear a clergy person say those things, I lose my mind, and they're going to hear about it. I had a friend in Chicago whose cancer took her chance from having children away from her, and her pastor told her that maybe God didn't want her to have children. First of all, as if he knew what God thought. But also, my community, that is just terrible pastoral care. You just don't get to talk to people like that. I wrote a letter, and I hand-delivered it, and he got to hear what I thought. There's, there's never a God-ordained reason. There's never a God-ordained good reason that a child dies or that we hurt each other or that our marriage fell apart, that we got stuck in an abusive situation or that we find ourselves cold in the streets with no loved ones or community to reach out to. There's no good reason for it. And besides, in 2015, I didn't even want an easy answer. I just wanted to mourn. And I didn't want platitudes. But just a couple of weeks after my stepfather's death, the one right before Christmas, Andy and I found out that we were pregnant with our second child. Now, I believe that our bodies kind of help work out our emotions. This is... I think, again, why I have a little bit of a cold right now. Um, I think that emotions kind of go into our muscles and our flesh, and they have to be dealt with. And our body kind of helps us work out, like, the trauma and the worry and the stress and the grief. And I hadn't even begun to deal with the grief of all of that loss when my flesh had to take on a new challenge, growing another person. So that's what I did. That's what I did. Um, I did it as gracefully as I could. We moved into a new house in June from, we were in like a tiny little apartment. So we moved into a house. Um, we used my father's furniture to furnish that home. We had moved all of his furniture into my in-law's basement into storage. And so then we had the whole, like, taking it back out and now claiming it as ours. And when we moved into the new house, there were things that needed to be fixed, which was really hard because my stepfather was the handy one among us. And so it was like, who's going to do that? None of us know. None of us know how to do these things. So my husband was going to have to learn how to get really handy really quickly. The grief would pop up and I would shove it down. There was always like a sermon I had to write for that Sunday or a parishioner who needed me more. I told myself that I would deal with it all later. No holiday was ever the same again. But it was okay because I knew that at least soon I would have my arms wrapped around this precious little boy that was growing inside of me. My labor was only three hours long. <sighs> it hit and it hit hard. The wave of hormones was like nothing I had ever experienced. It was not like my first delivery at all. It took me 15 minutes to realize I was in labor. I called my mom. It took her 30 minutes to drive from West County down to the city. And then it took us 30 minutes to drive from the city back out to the hospital in West County. My contractions were three minutes apart when we got into the car. They had gone from like 15 to three in 45 minutes. And by the time we got to the hospital, they were less than one minute apart. The doctor got there and we were ready to push. And my first push was great, but the hormones were just surging. And then halfway through the second push, I just stopped. I just stopped pushing. The nurse asked if I was tired, and I didn't say anything. I just looked away and started crying. And the nurse told me that I needed to respond so that they knew I was okay. <clears throat> Winter, we need to know that you're here. Are you with us? Are you with us? 
And I looked up and I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. And I don't want this baby. And I don't want to be here. Weeks later, my OBGYN would explain to me that it's very rare that postpartum depression hits during delivery, but that with that type of surge of hormones and with that kind of buried grief, that it is not actually uncommon. And so she said, I need you to look at me. And I did. And she said, put your hand between your legs. I said, I know it's down there. She goes, I need you right now to put your hands between your legs and look me in the eye. And I did. And she said, this is where we are right now. This is where we are right now, and we're going to deal with this. And then everything else we're going to deal with later. But this is where we are right now, and I need you to handle it. And we're going to get this child out of you. And there was something about the sternness and no nonsenseness of her voice that was surprisingly comforting. And I pushed this little boy out, and I saw my husband just fall in love, and they put him on my chest, and I felt nothing. Nothing. I saw my husband was in love with him, which brought me joy. I was happy with Andy. I was really impressed by the nurses. But for my child, I felt nothing. And I mean, just four hours before, while he was still in my belly, I was in love. And I didn't understand what had happened. They got me a team very quickly to help. I was surrounded by great people by great people, and I hope that if you are ever in a place where you have dealt with loss or grief or trauma, that there was a community who stepped up to be with you. Because man, it takes community at that time, doesn't it? I was in therapy within four days. I had my family over basically 24 seven to help care for the baby, though that might not have been my favorite part. <laughs> Eventually, I was like, I think you need to just go home. Um, we're okay here. We're okay. But they wouldn't listen because they loved me too much. And I have a husband who could not have been better. Andy was so smart. I'd say, God, I just, I don't love him. I feel so bad. I don't feel anything for him. And he'd be like, so? <laughs> and he was like, are you going to hurt him? And I was like, no. I, I have no feeling like I'm going to hurt him. He goes, well, I mean, can you, can you nurse him? Can you feed him? And I was like, yeah. He's like, that's it. That's our job. These kids don't belong to us. Basically, we have to keep them fed and do as little damage as possible. <laughs> and he's, he's like, that's like 18 years if we do that right, maybe 25, and they're gone. <laughs> and he's like, did, did you marry me to give me babies? And I was like, no. I'm, well, why did you marry me? Well, I married you because I love you more than anyone else. And he said, yeah, so just look at me. Just look at me and remember these kids are going to grow up and leave anyway, so <laughs> we'll just fake it till we make it. <laughs> Andy carried me. He did. He carried me. And my first therapy session was a riot. So I'm four days postpartum, so you can just imagine what I looked like, the state of my entire being and body. And I walk into this office it's a counselor I hadn't been to, and it was suggested by my doctor, who I greatly trust. And um, it's, a, it's a Christian counselor, which I thought was probably a good idea, because I, I use a lot of big biblical terms. And, and seeing someone who's been to seminary, so when I see, see things like eschatology, they know what I mean, right? So I walk in, and they were like playing Christian rock music on the radio like on the speakers around me. And like I preach the modern worship service I do, but like that's not my thing. And it is not what I wanted to hear. And I was like, ugh, this is gonna be terrible. <laughs> and I sat down in the chair in the waiting room and listening to this music and it was just like, I mean, I, I could just hear Kirsten 
you know, uh, singing, our modern worship music leader, singing these tunes and everybody being happy and praising God. And I was like, I can't do this. And so I just like put my headphones in and put some, listen to something else. And I knew it wasn't going to work out, but I thought I'd give it a shot. So I went in and I told her what had happened um, in the delivery room. And then she asked, um, she said, okay, that's pretty interesting. Do you think that there's like anything else kind of speaking into this? Have you had any grief or trauma that you've left unmanaged before or during the pregnancy? And I kind of laughed out loud for the first time since Milo had been born. Like I laughed at her and I was like, yeah, I mean a little. Uh, so in 2015, like I lost my brother, my dad, and my stepdad. I became the head preaching pastor at the second largest um, service of one of the largest Methodist congregations in the United Methodist Church. And I did that with no therapy at all. <laughs> and, I, and then I got pregnant and then I just kind of kept pushing it down. So she very nicely said to me, I don't want to be rude, <laughs> but as a pastor, what would you have told a parishioner who is sitting in your shoes right now? And I was like, I mean, we don't have to be mean about it, you know? Like, we both know that I did the wrong thing here, okay? I am aware that I, I left this untended, that I didn't bring it to God, that I didn't find my community when I needed them, that I let it get buried, that I let it out on my spouse, that I did it wrong. I know that. So you don't have to be gentle with me. I'm aware that I have a lot of undealt with grief, but I'm ready to start that work. Can we just start the work, please? And so we did. We did. Twice a week for therapy, Andy for daily comfort, I still managed to nurse. I still managed to not have to get on meds. My friend Hannah would come over every few days and just make me get out of the house, take me to Walgreens for five minutes just so I could breathe fresh air. And Milo was the easiest, happiest baby that I have ever met, which just made it even more heartbreaking that I did not have any feelings for him at all. Right around that time, our country went through what has been considered one of the most divisive elections that we have ever experienced together. It was a year ago. And I remember when Trump was voted in, there were some feelings that came back for me. There were feelings that began to bubble up, but for my son, there was still nothing. I was beginning to deal with the grief and, and have emotions back in my other relationships, but nothing yet for Milo. <clears throat> so eventually Advent came. And I began to unpack our Christmas decorations. I thought, I thought, you know, maybe like if I if I put on my Pandora music station, Christmas music station, and I pull out our Christmas decorations, that I'll think of these wonderful memories that Andy and I have had and built together and, and that um, maybe I'll, I'll just have a good day. Maybe I'll have a better day than I've had in a while. And so I did. And the first thing I stumbled upon was my grandmother de Graff's nativity. It had been passed down to my father and it stayed at his house. And then after he died, we had packed it up in stuff. But we hadn't, we hadn't had a place to unpack it yet, so this was the first year that I would unpack it. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of decided I was just gonna deal with it. I was like dealing with anxiety after the election, dealing with sadness and shame about the depression. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna dive in and try to do this setting up this nativity thing and see if God and I can start talking again because that had not yet happened. And so I began unwrapping each of the pieces very delicately. They're um, carved wood pieces. They're beautiful. And I was unwrapping them and I just started to weep. Remembering my dad, 
realizing that this family nativity was meant to be passed to me and it has found its new home and that one day it would go to my kids. I looked around and I saw all of his furniture. I saw the empty boxes of outdoor Christmas lights that Andy used to hang up everywhere, just like my stepdad Gary used to do, and how my brother Tom would never get on the top of the roof to hang the lights up high because he was so afraid of heights. And I just wept, and I wept. It's just like me in my pajamas, crying on my kitchen floor, clutching onto a wooden carved shepherd boy to my chest, (laughs) just crying. And then I realized I wasn't the only one crying. Milo had woken from his nap. And just like that, my body responded. I remember thinking like my mind and my soul was still weeping on the floor, but my body was next to his cradle in a heartbeat. And I was lifting him in my arms, making sure that he knew everything was okay and that he was safe. And I was telling him that it was all gonna be okay. And for the first time, I meant it. And I looked at him, and I was in love for like 10 seconds. But that was more than enough at that time. I got 10 seconds. And then I just cried harder because I was so happy. (laughs) So all the tears of sadness and tears of joy just began to mix and mingle. And at that moment, on my Christmas music station, Oh Holy Night came on. Um, the version was by this band called Weezer. And I held on to Milo, and I continued to unwrap the nativity. And this is my favorite piece. He's one of the magicians. Some call him Balthazar. <laughs> and this one is Joseph. He was the best husband ever. <clears throat> He's a lot like your dada. And then this one is Mary. She's super brave and courageous, and God came through for her, just like she will for us. And this is baby Jesus, because God comes to us in the most vulnerable spaces. And Milo fell back asleep in my arms, and I laid him back down. And then I went back and I listened to Weezer's Old Holy Night like 20 more times, Mm -hmm. trying desperately to hold on to that moment of emotion that I had. And I knew it was going to be okay and that we were going to be okay. And I sat down at my computer for my first time in months since I had started maternity leave and I began writing the sermon series that I would return to Manchester UMC with, something that I did not even think I was going to be able to do not just writing it, but being able to return. And I was writing that sermon series about how God indeed calls us and how God will use our darkest, most difficult spots to offer light to others in this world and about how we belong to each other, no matter if the Cubs won the World Series or if the person that you didn't, that you didn't vote for, you know, got elected that we were going to belong to each other and we were going to be okay. That we could have our own fears and our doubts and our sufferings, but that we were not going to let each other go. And I just kept looking up at that nativity. There's no good reason for suffering or for loss. It's just how life happens. I don't have words of consolation for that. I don't. It's the way things are. But I realized last year that Advent is not only like the darkest season kind of in um, the actual seasons and the rotation of the planet, But that Advent is the darkest Christian season out of all of our church seasons. It's filled with lectionary texts or filled with words from the prophets screaming out to God, begging for things to change. They're filled with stories about 
people being between a rock and a hard place and just waiting on God to come back and change things. It was a dark time 2,000 years ago. And it's a dark time for us right now. But it was into that darkness that a little tiny light was born. And it was born in a very unexpected and strange way. And that little baby, that little vulnerable baby with that little tiny light inside of him grew into a light that could cast out all darkness from there until the end of time. Or that little lightness, that little light that can be the light for us when we cannot find our own anymore. It can be the one to guide us and lead us, even if we're not convinced that our candle's ever going to get relit. <clears throat> and you don't have to be convinced that it will be. You don't have to be certain. You can, but you don't have to be, okay? You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to pretend like you have it all together. You don't have to pretend like it's, been, it's better now or that the wounds are not still there. You don't have to be God. You don't have to be God. You can be a person and you can trust people with grief. If there's one thing that human beings can be trusted with, it's grief. You're allowed to yell or to ask questions like the psalmist did. You can hate Christmas music. You can be mad. You can feel all the feelings that you need because you can trust a human being with grief. God knows that. And no one can take that from you or from I. Your right to feel what you need to feel and to be where you need to be. No one can take that from you or I. And God is big enough to handle it. God is big enough to wrap God's arms around you in that space. Whether it's through a strange mystical moment, an encounter you have with God, or through the arms of a friend reaching out. You can trust a human being with grief. So this, this blue Christmas thing we're doing, on this the longest night of the year, the only words of hope I really have are just a reminder that you're not alone that you're not alone. You have community and you have God. And the light is going to return. The light will return, whether or not you believe it. So, children of God, let us hear the good news of our gospel. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Amen.